Damn, I had to bail on that one again. You have got to be on the ball with these, with these brakes. Emergency braking on these is no joke. That much is very good. <laughs> Right then, ladies and gents, I'm out here in the beautiful Cornish countryside this morning, um, looking pretty fresh as well, I've got to say, but importantly, I'm staying nice and cozy, thanks to Sirocco, who have dropped in to sponsor another video, which is cool. So everybody knows, getting out on the bike this time of year is always a massive kind of struggle, I suppose, especially if it's like it is this morning. I mean, like it's cold and damp and not particularly appealing. And while Sirocco can't completely solve that problem, having a decent set of winter cycle gear really does take the edge off. So this is one of their J1 cycle jackets. I've been using an all black version of this over the last year, but they just dropped a load of new colors. And this one matches my bike and my shoes, baby. So yeah, looking fresh, as mentioned. Uh, yeah, I'm also using their winter bib tights. So these have some nice windproof panels on the calves and the thighs. And yeah, importantly for me, especially, they've got really good bum padding because I'm using this monstrosity for a saddle. Um, yeah, these X1 glasses are new as well. So they've got photochromic lenses and this cool like adjustable nose clip to, to sort of fit all sorts of different faces. So yeah, I just really like the Sirocco stuff. All the gear is really well designed. The clothes fit well and they wash really well too. And they're just great value. And that's why I'm so pleased to have them as a sponsor because I think they kind of slot in quite nicely with the whole ethos of the of the stuff I'm doing, I suppose. So yeah, if you did want to pick up some winter cycle kit, then use my link in the description below and you can get 10% off your order when you, when you pick something up. And they got all sorts of new gear, as I'd said, so definitely worth a look. Anyway, all that aside, let's check out this hydraulic roof set. Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another J'adore Le Bicyclette, a uh, Trace Fellow production. My name, as always, is, uh, yeah, it's, it's Link. Right, so in the last episode, I put some mechanical disc brake calipers through through the ringer, specifically, uh, specifically these bad boys, a juicy pair of nuts. Um, yeah, uh, a set of hybrid hydraulic calipers from a Chinese brand called uh, called Z Race, and finally a set of Juintec F1 calipers. So I did some back-to-back -back brake runs to kind of test test performance, and although it was close, the Juintecs they came out on top, and they're quite easily actually my favourite of those three calipers. I ran them for a couple of thousand miles, and they were basically flawless. Haven't really got a bad word to say about them, to be honest with you. So check out that video up here if you uh, haven't seen it already, it's gonna provide a little bit of context as to what we're trying to do today. But as undeniably fabulous as that, as that last episode was, um, one question remains unanswered. How does a well kind of installed mechanical disc brake setup really compare to the real deal? I am talking of course about fully hydraulic. Now for regular viewers, I'm, I'm sure it will come as a little surprise that I've always shied away from using fully hydraulic group sets on my road bike here because A, they are very expensive and B, which is directly related to A, I'm a massive fucking cheapskate. Um, so what, like easily upwards of six, seven hundred pounds for a, for a fully hydraulic group set. Yeah, just a, a little bit too expensive if you ask me. However, a little while ago I picked myself up a wee bargain and as of last month I am now a member of the fully hydraulic elite. Now the mere mention of mechanical disc brakes, or God forbid, rim brakes, oh, disgusting. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, I'm now running uh, fully hydraulic brakes on the front and the back. So I'll quickly show you the group set. Definitely one of the cheapest kind of hydraulic group sets I've, uh, I've come across. And then I'll go through the install and then I'll rerun the same set of tests that I did for the mechanical calipers in the, in the last episode. And we'll see which ones come out on top. So lots to cover. And as my dad says, let's stop mucking about and get on with it. Right, so this is the group set I picked up. So I got both shifters on the front there, and then it got the hydraulic caliper on the front, and then one on the back there. So that's what I picked up. Now these do look quite strange, actually. They've got quite bulbous tops here on these on these shifters, but they're quite similar, actually, to another set of shifters that I reviewed in the past from a company called Micronew. They also had quite bulbous tops of the hoods as well. 
Now, at first glance, it might not really look like it, but these are actually from Shimano these shifters here. So they're based on the previous generation of 105. So the current gen of 105 is the R7000 and these are the mechanical R7000 shifters here. But these are based on the previous version of 105. So 105 5800. Um, the actual name for this group set is the RS505. It came out in 2016 and to be frank, it was, it was not particularly popular. People mainly thought it was pretty ugly, which arguably it is, I suppose. But a lot of people had issues with the ergonomics associated with these shifters. Now the criticisms mainly centered around this little lump, which you can see on the side of the shifter here. So this is where the hydraulic uh, hose fits into the back of the shifter. Uh, but I personally have zero issues with these uh, shifters from an ergonomic perspective. I think they're incredibly comfortable. And I actually really like this bulbous style on the top here. When you're in that semi TT pose on the top of the hoods, these offer a really secure hold when you're in that position. Now, what I would say is that if you have smaller hands, these might not be for you, but I personally think that they're, they're, they're fantastic uh, shifters. And breaking aside, because it's Shimano and it's 105, the overall shifting performance is pretty stellar as well. Now, cost-wise, I picked up my set a few months back, actually, for 250 pounds, bit of a bargain. I would say, but unfortunately, the big retailers don't seem to have them in stock anymore because they were discontinued by Shimano. Um, but eBay uh, and the like definitely seen a few on there for under 300 pounds, and there are loads secondhand. These are not particularly sought after, so you can usually find yourself a bargain. And in general, Shimano stuff is pretty bulletproof, so the secondhand market is definitely a viable option in this case if you kind of want to get yourself set up with a fully hydraulic on a bit of a budget. Anyway, this is the very first hydraulic group set I've actually, I've actually owned. So it was the first one I've ever installed. And, and starting out, I was a little bit trepidatious actually, mainly because fitting the hydraulic hoses properly seemed a little bit intimidating. But whilst there was a small learning curve, it was actually surprisingly, surprisingly easy to install actually. So with that being said, let's dive in. Okay, so the first thing to mention is that setting up and installing the gear cables is exactly the same as any other group set, but it's the hydraulic brake hose that we're here to discuss. So this is the basic principle for install. You have the hydraulic hose itself, and then you've got these two things here, and I'll quickly show you. The one on the right there, that is an olive, and this one on the left, that is a barb. So once you cut your um, hydraulic brake hose to length, what you need to do is insert a barb into the end there. So this is generally done using the help of these two blocks here. If these don't come with the group set, these are really cheap to buy online. And what you do is it just helps you hold the hose in place. So you put it around the hose like that, put it in a clamp or use some vice grips or something like that, and then get your barb and tap it into that hole until it's basically flush, till it's flush with the end of the hose. Do that on both ends of your cut hydraulic hose and then it's ready to install into the shifter and the calipers. Okay, so once you've got your barb installed into your hose, you get this clamping nut, which can usually be found installed into the back of the shifter or on the caliper itself. Slide that over the hose and follow that with one of those olives there. Now what's gonna happen is when you screw this nut back into the shifter or the caliper, it's gonna crush that olive onto the hose, sealing it up nicely. And this is what a, a kind of crushed one looks like. So I've just pulled this out of the back of one of those shifters. And you can see there we've got a barb in the end and that olive is crushed nicely around that hydraulic brake hose, sealing it up nicely. Um, and that in a nutshell is how you set up hydraulic brake hose. Next step will be bleeding the brakes. But all in all, I would say that's a pretty simple process and much less involved than I initially anticipated. Okay, so this is what this hydraulic setup looked like fresh out of the box. So you've got hydraulic hose pre-applied to both shifters and both calipers. And that's because these are already filled with hydraulic fluid. So set this up properly and you might not even have to bleed the brakes. So the idea is you've got a bung in the end of this quick connector here. You pull out that bung, get the, the hydraulic hose out of the back of the caliper, pop that in the end and do up that nut because there's already an olive kind of installed inside this um, connector, ready to be crushed. And if you look at the hose here, coming out of the back of the caliper, it's already got one of those barbs installed into the hose, and there's even a little white plastic membrane kind of to stop all the hydraulic juice from coming out. So when you pop that in there, there's a little spike actually inside this connector, which punctures that white membrane. So pop that in, screw up that nut, and you're basically ready to go. And hopefully, 
these won't even need bleeding. Now, during my install of this setup, I'm not actually gonna be making use of these quick connector hoses out of the back of the shifter, mainly because the end here is quite chunky and won't easily kind of thread through my integrated carbon handlebars. The spaces are quite narrow. Um, so I've, uh, I'll, I'll be taking these off as I have done with this shifter here and I'll be plumbing the, uh, the brake hose directly into the back of the shifter there. Now, hopefully the lengths of hoses that have been pre-applied to the calipers will be uh, long enough, but it's difficult to tell before you actually install it onto the bike. But even if these aren't the kind of the right length or aren't quite long enough, I have some additional brake hose here and I can just cut my own lengths. Um, anyway, regardless, the only way to find out is to get it installed. So let's go. Okay, so I'm just setting myself up to, to fit the group set tomorrow morning. It's this, the night before. But I've realized there's something I've always wanted to kind of figure out. So conventional wisdom states that a fully hydraulic group set like this one is gonna weigh a lot more than a more conventional mechanical group set. But how well does that translate over to a bike like this that uses kind of a mechanical disc? Um, yeah, I'm really interested to know if this is gonna be heavier and if so, by how much? Because thinking about it, you've obviously got hydraulic fluid running through the brake lines on, on this group set. Whereas on this one, you've got quite chunky steel cables running all the way through the bike. So I'm really interested to compare the two and see, see yeah, what, what the weight difference is between them. Um, so yeah, I've got the scales up there and I'm gonna weigh my bike as it sits right now. And it's probably in its lightest ever configuration actually, because we've got quite a light group set. So this is the carbon fiber Sensar Empire uh, group set. So we've got carbon brake levers on, on either side and then a carbon oversized pulley cage on the back there. So yeah, it's the lightest it's probably ever been this bike. So let's get it on the scales and see what it weighs. So I've got the, uh, the scales turned on up there. Let me see if I can get this hung up one handed. It's been a while since I've weighed this bike actually. So quite interested to see what it comes out as. Right, let's hang that up. What, 7.265, wow. I am genuinely, I thought that was about seven and a half. 7.265, wow, and that is both bottle cages on and, and pedals as well, and an 11 to 32 tooth cassette on the back. Wow, that is, I thought it was about seven and a half. Blimey, anyway, there you go. 7.265 kilos as it stands right now. Pretty, pretty impressed with that, <laughs> I've got to say. Kind of don't want to change it. No, I've got to do it. Right, <laughs> there you go. That's what it is. So let's get this uh, group set installed tomorrow and we'll see where we stand. The next day. Right then folks, it's the next morning and first job of the day, get yourself a black coffee and check on that. Right, <laughs> next up, I gotta start pulling this existing group set off the bike. Should be pretty straightforward. So let's get going. Okay, so pulling off the bar tape here and removing the front and rear derailleurs, easy. Now for this install, the braking system is being replaced, but the gears are still cable actuated or mechanical. So I can reuse the cable housings running to the front and rear derailleurs, which does make my life easier as I don't have to size and cut new ones. Right, okay, so I am at a pretty key stage in this process. So I've pulled off the front derailleur and the rear derailleur there, and they just sat on the floor back there, and I've pulled some of the bar tape off. And I'm gonna try and reuse this actually, because it's still in pretty good nick. So yeah, I'm at the stage where I'm gonna pull the shifters off, and with it, pull out the old brake and gear cables. But with a frame like this that uses internally rooted cables, I need to take this additional step, and I'm sure a lot of you will have heard me bang on about this before, but with the gear cables, what I'm doing is as I'm pulling them out, I need to make sure I run these white cable guide tubes over the top of the cables so that when the cables are no longer through the frame, the guide tubes will sit in their place. So when I'm re-cabling with the new group set, I can just run the new gear cables through those guide tubes and, and Bob's your uncle, good to go. With the brakes, in this instance, it's not so much of a big deal because I'm gonna be replacing all of the housing run with the new hydraulic hose anyway. But with the gears, I've gotta take that additional step. Anyway, with that being said, uh, yeah, let's crack on. Right, so next steps, I'm running the rest of the cable guide tubes over the gear cables. A bit of a fiddly job on a frame like this where everything is internally rooted, but I've actually covered it in a, in a lot of detail on a previous video, so you can check that out later if you like. Anyway, once that's all done, I can undo the bolts holding the shifters onto the handlebars and then pull them off along with all the old cables running through the bike frame. Now, this might seem complex um, at first when you, when you look at it, but as long as those cable guide tubes are properly in place, you're pretty much good to go. Right, so as you can see, I've made some pretty good progress, actually. So, yeah, both of the shifters have been pulled off the bike and they're just down here so you can see all the cables. I've pulled the cables out, out with them, so that's good. And I've run the cable guide tubes 
through the frame and you can see here I've taken the precautionary measure of taping them to the frame because if these fall out or, or fall back into the frame you're a little bit scuppered so make sure you tape them down and keep them secure. Yeah wheels are off obviously and the brake calipers the Juintex have been pulled off as well. So next step is just the install of the hydraulic group tech basically and a, and a key question for me right now is whether these pre-applied hydraulic hoses are going to be long enough. So I've got the front and the and the rear. I've put them up against the frame and they look like they will be but I won't really know until I get into the meat of the install. Um, so yeah I think I'm just going to beast mode it because the majority of the complexity for the next few steps is just navigating the hydraulic hoses through the frame and especially through these quite tight kind of corners in my um, integrated bar and stem here. So yeah I'm just going to crack on and I'll check back in with you when I've got a little bit of an update. Okay, so I'm at the stage where I need to run the hydraulic brake hoses through the frame. Now, what I ended up doing was using the existing brake housing that was already running through the frame and handlebars to pull the new hydraulic brake hoses through. So you can see in this picture that I just connected them together using some blue tape. So while I was pulling the old compressionless brake housing out, the new hydraulic hose was being pulled through in its place. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure there are better ways to do it, but all things considered, this actually worked really well, so yeah. Happy days. Uh, right, so um, yeah, it does, it does look like a bit of a bomb site in here, but I tend to make a mess like this when I'm recabling. But still, great news, the pre-applied hoses were basically exactly the right length. So I've got the rear one here, that was easy enough to feed through the frame, and then it pops out the side here, so it's this curved one here, goes through the bar, and then that's the one there on top. So that's the hose for the, for the rear brake. The front hose could maybe have been a centimeter longer, but it will definitely work. So it goes up through the fork and it's this straight one here and it goes into the bar and it appears on the top there. Now you might be able to see there's a little scuff on the housing and then one back there, but they're only cosmetic and they're very shallow. And I made sure I didn't kink or, or bend the, uh, the hose very much at all really when installing. So it should be absolutely, absolutely fine. And you might also be able to see that I'm gonna reuse the gear, the gear cable housings that are kind of poking through because uh, yeah, they're not very old and they're absolutely fine. So I'll reuse the gear housings for the for the bike. But still, that was um, yeah a lot easier than I thought it would be actually. So next steps, I've got to get the uh, the shifters on. Now installing the gear cables is exactly the same as any other group set. And in terms of uh, attaching the, the the brake hoses, I'll just do exactly as I demonstrated earlier. So um, yeah, put the nut on, followed by an olive, and then screw it into the back of the shifter <laughs> and yeah then we're done and we'll just bleed the brakes and we're, we're good to go so yeah much easier than I thought it would be this whole process but still not at the end yet so let's keep going okay so the hydraulic hoses and brakes are in place the cable housings and guide tubes for the gears are good to go so here's where it all comes together now fitting the shifters onto the bars is easy enough just slide the clamps around and use the nut in the back of the shifter to secure them onto the handlebars Running the gear cables for these shifters is just like any other mechanical group set, as I've, uh, as I've mentioned, so no massive surprises there. But let me take some time here and show you how to fit the hydraulic brake hose into the back of the shifter. Right, so as I'm about to crimp this, I thought I may as well give you a bit of a close-up. So you can see what I've done here. So this is the one for the rear hose. Um, I've got the clamping nut there and then this little olive, which I've slid on the top. I've also put a little bit of grease around it. Um, just uh, to give it the best chance of sealing. So let me get around the other side and I'll quickly show you how to uh, crimp this up. Okay, so we wanna get this fitted into, into this here. So all you need to do is pop that in like that, push it kind of as far in as it will go, make sure it's nicely seated in there, and then hold it and basically tighten it up and it is as simple as that. So let's get this done. And uh, yeah, do this on both sides. And the brake hose is installed. Good to go. Right then, just uh, having a quick, quick sit down. Been a, been a long day today. Anyway, let me show you uh, the progress I've made. It's uh, pretty significant as you can see, but still, I'll walk you through it and it should make sense. So I've got the front and the rear derailleur mounted up here. And you will have seen earlier, I had the cable guide tubes already running through the frame. So when they're in place and you've already got your your cable housings cut to length because as mentioned I'm just reusing the existing cable housings because these are these are still in in really good nick so these are absolutely fine so um yeah recabling was a breeze and I've, I've shown how to do it many times so I didn't want to kind of rehash it anyway got these uh fitted up and these are actually 105 R7000 front and rear rear derailleurs there and the shifters at the top here are actually from the previous generation so 105 
5800 shifters, but it's all cross compatible, and the gear shifting is, uh, yeah, works works perfectly actually, which is great. And you'll see at the bottom here, I've got a pretty pretty bling bling looking oversized pulley cage on the on the rear derailleur, really. and I've done I've done a whole video on this actually, which you can check out up here uh, if you want to see that in a bit more detail. Anyway, let me show you what's going up uh, going on up the front here because um, yeah, the complicated bit in this setup was not running the brake hoses, fitting them into the back of the shifter and crimping that olive that I showed earlier. That was very straightforward. The, the fiddly bit was actually running the gear cables, because you can see here, on this particular model of shifter, the gear cable runs all the way from the top of the shifter here, down the side and out the back. So kind of smoothly feeding the, the gear cable through was a little bit fiddly, so a bit of a quirk with these particular shifters. But anyway, these are fitted up and, and mounted, ready to go in their final position. So next step is actually bleeding bleeding the brakes because all the all the, the kind of brake hoses are ready to go. So I've got a bleed kit here and I've never done this before. So it could be a complete disaster, but <laughs> I've watched a couple of videos on how to do it. So yeah, let's give this, yeah, let's give this a go. Right, so I did initially intend to show you the process of bleeding the brakes, but frankly, the footage was a complete mess. I had to have several stabs at it and it was full of mistakes. I, I watched a number of videos on it, including a really detailed one from Park Tool, but I was just struggling to get all of the air bubbles out of the brake lines until I watched this video from Rides of Japan and then it all made sense. If I'd have followed these instructions from the outset, it, it would have been a complete breeze. So rather than me trying to explain things I don't really understand, I'm gonna leave it up to the pros. So I've linked that video in the corner up here and also it's in the video description. So massive thank you to Rides of Japan. You completely saved my bacon on this, on this install. Anyway, that aside, now the bike is all complete. Yeah, let's get this thing on the scales. Right, it's been a pretty long day today. But have a look at this, fully hydraulic group set. Ooh. <laughs> I am really excited to try it all out, but it's the middle of the night um, right now, so I, I, I can't. But um, anyway, uh, with that being said, let me, let me, well, let's get it on the scales, right? That's, the, that's what we're here for. So um, yeah, just to quickly note, it's exactly the same chain as it was before, actually. I haven't done many miles on this and it's absolutely fine. And I haven't had to resize it either, which is, which is great. The same cable housings as I've kept banging on about this whole time. And in fact, it's the same um, bar tape. So the only thing that's changed is the installation of this uh, fully hydraulic group set. So with that being said, let's stick the scales on and we'll see when it comes out to. So I'm gonna try and do this one-handed again. So get that hooked on, bear with, and she's swinging. 7.480, so what was it before? Let me check my notes here. 7.265 before. So that's an, uh, an additional 215 grams. Um, not bad. I would say so. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the penalty basically that you pay for fully hydraulic, 215 grams. It's still under 7.5, so that keeps me happy. Um, but there you go, uh, a 215 gram weight penalty for a fully hydraulic group set. Right, let's jump into the testing. But before we do, if I could quickly ask you to subscribe and maybe hit the like button as well if you haven't already, that'd be wicked. Genuinely helps me out a ton and just kind of helps me keep on top of the YouTube algorithm. So um, yeah, thank you in advance. Right, so here's the setup, same as last time. We've got these lightweight disc rotors. So 160s on the front there and also on the back. And in terms of the brake pads, again, I'm using the stock resin pads that came supplied with the calipers. So these happen to be Shimano JO2A resin pads, and these have actually been replaced recently by Shimano with the updated JO3A pads, but the only difference between the two is the updated version lasts 40% longer than this older variant. From what I've read, the braking performance between the two is completely identical. Um, right, so there we go. That is the testing setup. So with that out of the way, let's get out there and start the testing. Right then, ladies and gents, we are back at the uh, at the test at the test strip, and I've I've bought my fully hydraulic uh, group set on my, on my bike to test to test again. So the last time we were here, I was testing uh, mechanical disc brake setups, and the calipers that worked the best were the the Juintex using their stock resin brake pads, and they averaged 13.3 meters over 10 over 10. 10 brake pulls. So this is the setup. So I'm going to come careening down this kind of, uh, well, it's not so much a hill, more of a shallow slope 
hit this line on the tarmac there at 20, 25 miles an hour using uh, my Garmin as a, as a reference. So 25 miles an hour and then pull the brakes as hard as I dare basically. And I've marked out five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, out to 20 meters there. Um, yeah, and we'll see uh, what the braking distance is for these, for these fully hydros. Really interested to see. I suspect they'll be better than the Juantex, but by how much? Yeah, let's find out. Okay, so worth mentioning, at the point of starting the testing here, I'd already bedded the pads in using the same process as I did last time. And I was about 60 or 70 miles into the group set by this point. Now there are some massive hills where I live, so I'd had a chance to give the brakes a bit of an initial test, but no emergency stops as yet. So I was still pretty fresh. Now it became immediately apparent that the style of emergency braking I'm doing here felt vastly different on fully hydros. I got my weight as far back over the rear wheel as I could when braking, but the, the, but the front brake was just, it was so strong that on basically every run, the back wheel would lift off the ground. And on a couple of runs, I just had to bail because I was about to endo and go right over the handlebars. But I gave it my all. I basically ruined a new rear tire. The rear would lock up instantly when emergency braking. And you can see in this picture here, the massive black streaks left on the tarmac with the rear tire just, just dragging. But with all that done, what are the results? Okay, so in the last episode, testing mechanical disc, the Juantec F1 calipers came out on top. So same bike, same disc rotors, same testing strip, um, and pretty much identical weather conditions as well. The Juantecs had an average of 13.3 meters in stopping distance, which you can see on that graph there. The RS505 uh, fully hydraulic setup here, that averaged 10.7 meters, which again, you can see on the on the graph. However, two of those runs are in gray and they're marked void, basically because I had to bail on those brake runs because I was about to go over the front of the handlebars. Um, if I'd have included those runs, the average would have been much closer to the Juantex. And I think that itself highlights a major difference between mechanical disc and fully hydro. So yes, braking performance on fully hydros is better than mechanical disc. You just have much more kind of raw stopping power available to you. Uh, but now the deciding factor in how well you can emergency brake moves away from the bike setup and over to you and your technique as a cyclist. I mean, I have no doubt that if I, if I gave this bike to a professional rider, they could easily knock a meter, maybe two or three off of my average stopping distance. But that's, that's kind of my point. I mean, to get the most out of these brakes in that application, your, your braking technique needs to be spot on. I mean, you could easily argue that for an amateur, mechanical disc is, is a bit more predictable and a bit more manageable as well in this particular application. So emergency braking. I mean, it was actually quite <laughs> quite scary during, during the testing of this bike because when I was using mechanical disc, as soon as I crossed that line on the tarmac, I could basically pull the brakes on both as, as hard as I could. But with the fully hydro setup here, as I was barreling down towards that stopping lineup, <laughs> 40 kilometers an hour, I was super reluctant to go 100% on the brakes because doing that, even with your weight as far back as possible, the rear wheel locks up instantly. And then as the weight transfers to the front of the bike, it's really difficult to prevent that rear wheel from lifting off the tarmac. And then by that point, 100% of the braking is done by the front wheel. And then any slight mistake or hit a little bit of loose gravel or something like that, and you're gonna crash, or you're just gonna fly over the front of the handlebars. Um, so yeah, I was, I, was actually, I was actually pretty nervous and found myself having to kind of ease in the braking once I crossed the line to kind of control how that braking power was applied. So um, yeah, let me grab a shifter here and I'll, I'll demonstrate for you. So as mentioned, on mechanical disc, as soon as I crossed the line, I could basically give it the beans on the brakes and hold it there and, until the bike stopped. On the fully hydros, I had to ease in the braking as mentioned, but then I could adjust lever throw on the fly whilst braking. So if I felt like I had the bike under control, I could maybe dial in a little bit more braking. Um, and equally, if I felt the bike get a little bit squirrely whilst I was braking, I could let off the brake slightly um, to regain control and then maybe bring it back in again at the end of the brake run just to kind of bring the bike to a stop. And that also kind of demonstrated to me another key characteristic of fully hydros that mechanical disc can't really compete with. 
Okay, so, uh, so everybody in the cycle industry, and I've actually said it before, bangs on about the fact that fully hydraulic brakes offer a greater level of modulation under braking. But it wasn't until I'd ridden mechanical disc and then fully hydro back to back that it really clicked for me. So let me try and lay it out for you here and explain it as best I can. Okay, so this is the best way I can kind of explain it. So you've got brake lever pull along the bottom here, along the x-axis, and braking power along, along the vertical, along the y-axis here. So I would say mechanical disc feels like this. So, um, yeah, you don't have much power until the end of the brake pull, uh, but even at the top end, it's kind of manageable around here. So most of your braking is done in kind of this region at the kind of top end of the lever pull. Hydraulic, on the other hand, feels a lot more like this. So yeah, very linear progression of power, I would say. You have more power at the top end here, but importantly, with fully hydraulic brakes, you can more easily modulate the power throughout the lever pull or kind of lever travel. That's kind of how it feels to me. So hopefully that makes sense. And that's kind of the best way I can describe the feeling of hydraulics versus cable actuated. So to kind of summarize, braking performance is not just about raw stopping power. I mean, if you're emergency braking all the time, something is probably, probably wrong. I mean, in the last few years, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've had to properly emergency brake. And even then, very rarely have I come to a kind of complete standstill. But a major characteristic of fully hydro is that compared to other braking setups, and I'm including rim brakes in this as well, not only is there more braking power on the table, they also offer a kind of more granular level of control in putting that power down on the tarmac. Okay, so something I would maybe compare it to, um, it's a bit, bit left of field, uh, but if you've ever played uh, like a first person shooter on a console, aiming with the kind of thumbsticks on the controller, it's a bit like comparing that to mouse and keyboard. So it, when you're aiming with a mouse, you just have a much finer level of control, um, I, I would say. Uh, I hope that kind of makes uh, makes some sense. But uh, anyway, with all that aside, let's uh, let's sum all this up. Right then, so mechanical disc versus fully hydraulic. Which one is the winner here? Well, it's very easy to argue that kind of fully hydraulic is the winner. And in many ways it is. I mean, it came out on top in the braking performance tests and there's no real question that fully hydraulic offers much more control in applying that braking force through the levers, but that's definitely not the whole story. So fully hydraulic is much heavier. The setup and installation was much less complicated than I thought it would be kind of going into it. Compared to mechanical disc, still requires some pretty specialist kit and bleeding the brakes, unless you kind of know what you're doing, can be quite frustrating and, and messy as well. And finally, I still think the cost far exceeds what most would be willing to pay for a group set. I mean, it's all well and good that I got my setup here for 250 quid a few months ago, but right now I think you'd struggle to match that. So let's face it, fully hydraulic setups on road bikes are still a luxury item, if you ask me, and they're definitely reserved for the kind of higher end of the road bike market. But after this kind of whole, uh, whole journey I've been on, here is, here's what I would say. Compared to fully hydraulic, a bike with a well-installed mechanical disc brake setup, which includes compressionless housing, which I covered in the last episode, is still a solid freaking choice, if you ask me, especially if you're building your first bike on a, on a bit of a budget, uh, more concerned with saving weight, or you do a lot of bike packing-esque riding out into the middle of nowhere, and so prefer the simplicity kind of associated with cable, cable actuated disc. But fully hydros are pretty flipping tasty. Um, they are expensive, there's no way around that really. And you could argue that for day-to-day -day riding out on the road with, with a road bike, performance is a, is a little bit overkill, but they are undeniably very good. Um, so if you can afford it, or maybe if you can pick up a kind of second-hand bargain, you definitely won't be disappointed. Um, in addition, I've said this a couple of times now, but installation was not that bad. Yes, there are a couple of additional steps, but I would say if you've installed a mechanical group set before, a fully hydraulic one should be well within your grasp. I mean, I'm just some douchebag. I'm, I'm not a trained mechanic or anything like that. I just do this for a hobby. I mean, if I wasn't filming, I probably could have banged out this install in about three or four hours maybe. But that being said, do check the comments section. I may have done something disastrously wrong during the install and there is no hiding from the cold hard truth delivered by the comments section. 
Uh, yeah. Um, oh, and if I've done a good job, let me know as well. I live and die for your approval. Uh, anyway, anyway, that's that. Um, so this is actually the last time you'll see me in this studio, AKA uh, small bedroom. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm leaving Cornwall. It's been a good year and a bit that I've been down here, but I'm going up country to Oxfordshire. Um, not that any of you care, but there, there we go. Um, right, well, that is all we've got time for. So subscribe if you like this kind of stuff. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this episode that I have delivered to you. And if you've got any questions or any comments about anything that I've kind of covered today, anything that I've talked about, leave me a comment down below and I'll try and get back to as many of you as I can. Um, right, well, that's it. So I'll see you all in the next episode. Ciao, ciao.